What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets, then hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south and then turns north. Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. Rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. Then the water returns again to the rivers and flows out again to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. Everything is meaningless. Completely meaningless. So what's the purpose? Uh, we all know this morning that it's uh, not wise to invest much time, much energy, and even money in something that is going to last for just a short period of time. For, for example, this morning, you would never quit your job because you just wanted to go to a party, would you? And if the party conflicted with your work schedule, you wouldn't say, hey, you know what, that's it. I'm quitting my job. I'm going to go to the party. That would be foolish. Uh, you would never pull money out of your retirement account because Publix had a sale of chocolates. And you would pull money out of your retirement account and just go buy as, as much chocolate as you possibly could. Why, why you would never sell your house to pay for a seven-day vacation. Why, all of those things would be crazy. You would never invest so much time, so much effort, and so much money in something that is just going to last for a few moments, something that's just going to last for a short period of time. Why would you jeopardize your future for the sake of a few minutes of pleasure? We all know today and agree that that would be totally irresponsible. Well, here's the idea that, that I want us to catch this morning. Why then do we spend so much time investing in this life when it's just a fraction of a second compared to eternity? We live this life often as if this was all there is. We live this life as if this life was everything, and as if eternity is nothing. Let me illustrate what I'm saying this morning. I have a, a rope that our, our praise team has, uh, has placed all the way over here. I'm going to take this rope, and I'm going to pull it along. Let's imagine this morning that this rope is your life. This rope illustrates my life. And let's imagine that this rope isn't tied to that flagpole. I don't want to pull it too far. I don't want to pull the flag over today. But, but let's imagine that this rope isn't tied to the flagpole, but this rope goes on forever and ever and ever. And this rope illustrates your existence. We all know, as we're going to see in Ecclesiastes today, that you and I were made not for this life. You and I were made for eternity. And so this rope represents my life, and it goes on forever and ever and ever and ever. And let's imagine that this little white piece, can, can you see the little white piece here? The, this little white piece represents my time here on earth. My time here on earth is just a, a fraction compared to how long I am going to live. And yet, quite frankly, many of us, all of us at times, act as if this were everything. Why, why live, we live as if nothing was going to happen after here. And, and we work, and, and uh, we work all of these years so that we get to this little point right here. We work and work and work and work and work so that right here we have just a little bit of enough money saved that we can enjoy this little period of time here. And we live as if this 
were everything. When in reality, this is just a fraction of a second compared to how long you and I are going to live. You see, for those of us that have trusted Jesus Christ as personal Savior, we believe that we are going to live forever in heaven. And sadly, we believe that those who haven't trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, although the Bible clarifies their existence as spiritual death, we believe that they will live forever somewhere. They will live forever separated from God. Here's the idea this morning. The idea is this. God has more in store for you than just your 70 plus years here on the earth. You and I were literally made for eternity. At the top of your outline, there's, there's a quote that says this, life is hardly more than a fraction of a second. Such a little time to prepare for eternity. Someone has said this, that you're never really ready to live until you're ready to die. You're not ready for this life until you're ready for the life to come. That's the theme of the passage that we're studying this morning. And so, once again, if you have your Bibles, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, we're going to begin reading in verse 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 9. Solomon asked the question that I'm sure all of us ask at times. You might ask this question tomorrow morning when you wake up and have to go to work. Verse 9, what do people really get for all their hard work? You ever ask yourself that question? Man, I work 40, 50, 60 hours. What do I get for all of my hard work? I give years and years to the company. They don't appreciate me. What do I get for all of my hard work? Verse 10, I have seen the burden God has placed on us all. Some translations say, I see the busyness that God has given to us with the business that we should pursue. Verse 11, yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. Notice this phrase, it's our theme this morning. He has planted eternity in the human hearts. Let me read that again. He has planted eternity in the human hearts. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. Verse 12, so I concluded that there is nothing better than to be happy and to enjoy ourselves as long as we can. And people should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of their labor. For these are gifts from God. Verse 14, and I know that whatever God does is final. Nothing can be added to it or taken from it. God's purpose is that people should fear Him. What is happening now has happened before. And what will happen in the future has happened before. Because God makes the same things to happen over and over again. Would you pray with me today? Father, we're so grateful that you have given us the Holy Spirit of God, who is our guide and who is our teacher. And so we pray this morning that the Holy Spirit would do for us what we cannot do ourselves. Help us to understand, help us to comprehend the magnitude of what Solomon is saying. Father, help us to think beyond our own finite minds today. Help us to realize that you are infinite. God, that you never had a beginning and you never will have an end. And Father, help us to realize that you created us as eternal creatures. Why, as Solomon says, you have placed eternity in our hearts. So, Father, I pray that you'd help each and every one of us to examine our lives to make sure that we're ready, Lord, for the life that follows this one. 
God, I pray that you would help us to live this life not as if it were everything, not as if it were all-inclusive, but Father, help us to realize that even when this life is done, Father, there is a life after this one. And I pray that you would help us to invest our time, our talents, our resources in things that will last for eternity. And so I pray that you'd not only teach us this morning, but Lord, I pray that you would convict us and mold us and shape us into who you want us to be. We love you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, If you're new, we're walking through the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes is one of the older books of the Old Testament written by Solomon in which Solomon literally kind of kind of bears his soul, uh, kind of opens up and shares his life testimony, not only the physical struggles that he went through, but even some of the emotional, some of the philosophical struggles that Solomon went through as he was trying to understand what life is all about and trying to comprehend what is the real meaning of life anyways. If you've read it, and I'd encourage you to do so at some point during our series, you'll see that, that Solomon pursued various things, trying to find happiness, trying to find satisfaction, and trying to find purpose. Why he sought for wisdom, and we've already seen how smart of a man Solomon was. Uh, he sought for pleasure. He sought for satisfaction in uh, in success and in buildings and in, uh, in 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 building an empire. And what an empire Solomon built! Why? Why he searched for pleasure in uh, in uh, in in sexual pursuits, as we've already seen. This man had seven hundred wives and three hundred concubines. Every desire that he had was met. And yet he comes to the conclusion over and over in the book saying, you know what, it's worthless, it's meaningless. It is just like chasing after the wind. And as we've said, many say that this is a track, an Old Testament track that is pointing people towards Jesus Christ. Well, the passage that we're looking at today is is debated. The passage that we're looking at today is misunderstood by many. As a matter of fact, verse 11, which is the basis for our message today, is one of the most debated verses in this book. Quite frankly, it's one of the most debated verses in the Old Testament. The debate centers around the phrase, he has placed eternity in the human now, now, the word eternity here is the Hebrew word olam, and it's a word the Jews repeatedly through the Old Testament. It's found some 450 times in the Old Testament. And if you do a word study, you can, you can Google it and you'll do a word study. You'll see that the word is translated a variety of ways. It's translated duration. It's translated forever. At times, it's translated world. And here in our passage, it's translated as eternity. As a result, Bible teachers have come to 10 different conclusions about this this verse. Now, don't worry, we're not going to look at all of them this morning. I don't want somebody to roll their eyes and say, my word, here we go, this is going to be a long one. We're not going to look at all of them this morning. In the context, we believe, and most believe, though, that Solomon is comparing the temporality of the things of this life He's comparing the temporality of our human existence with the eternality of our future. In other words, Solomon is writing about what we just illustrated with the rope, that our existence is not small, it's not short. We are going to live forever somewhere. You and I were made for eternity. And so as we read this passage of Scripture and we study it, and actually as we study the entire Bible, the question that cries out to my heart and to yours very simply is this, are you prepared for eternity? I'm not asking if you're prepared for work tomorrow or if you got your homework done and you're ready for school. I'm asking you, are you ready for eternity? That's what Solomon talks about 
in this passage. Four simple points that we're going to walk through today. Four simple but succinct points that kind of bring home what Solomon is teaching us. The first is this. Life is brief. Make it count. Life is brief, make it count. Uh, last week we looked at verses 1 through 8. We looked at that, that, that poem, as it were, that, that Solomon wrote in those first eight verses of the chapter. Why there is a, a time for every activity, a time for every season under heaven. And he went through in poetic form and said there's a time to be born, there's a time to die, there's a time to plant, there's a time to sow, there's a time to build, there's a time to tear down, there's a time for war. There's a time for peace. There's a time for love. There's a time for hate. He went through all the experiences of our life. Talking about your life and talking about my life. Well, he continues that theme in the passage that we're looking at today. And he uses a few phrases that relevantly describe your life and mine. I want you to see because, because I see my life in this passage of Scripture and I trust that you'll see your life as well. The first phrase that I pulled out is this. Your life is filled with busyness. Our lives are filled with busyness. Now, that's probably an understatement. As Americans, we are busier than Ever. I could have taken the time, I, I googled all kinds of uh, statistics on how busy we are, but you and I are busier than ever. In the U.S., the most recent statistics say that 85.8% of men and 66.5% of women work more than 40 hours a week. If I asked you, how many hours do you put in? You'd probably roll your eyes and you'd probably say, more than I want to put in. I, more, I work more than I want to. Man, we're extremely busy. You add on top of that all of our family commitments, our neighborhood commitments, our church commitments. And the simple truth is that we are busy folks. Sometimes so busy that we don't have time for God in our life. So Solomon gets that. And Solomon talks about that in the passage of Scripture that we're looking at. Verse 10 in the ESV, the English Standard Version, if you have it, verse 10 is translated this way. I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man, of men to be busy with. Solomon sits back and he says in his time, he says, man, we all have business we all have things that occupy our time. We all have things that keep us busy. If I asked you to give a testimony today and I asked you, are you busier than you want to be? I would, I, I, I would guess that most of us would say, yes, we're a lot busier than we want to be. Solomon describes that. He says, our lives are filled with busyness. Now, I want to pause here and just give some simple recommendations because you might sit back today and say, man, Brian, it seems like my life is on a roller coaster that never ends. It takes off in the morning and when it comes back to home base, it doesn't even allow me to get off. It just keeps going over and over and over again. And I can't get off the cycle. I can't get off the carousel. My life is just too busy. Here's a couple of simple recommendations that you know that at times we don't apply. The first is this, put God first in your life. Amen? Amen. Put God first. Start off your day with the Lord. Make meeting together as a church family a priority. There is nothing that helps to put the events of your life in order like spending a few moments with Jesus. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and live righteously and God will give you everything you need. 
I'm afraid many of us, myself included at times, we wake up in the morning and life is so hectic, life is so busy, our feet hit the ground and we hit the ground running and if we're not careful, we don't have any time for God. We're too busy for God. Well, quite frankly, if you and I are too busy for God today, we are simply too busy. Because our life is going to end before we know it, and you and I will stand before God. Solomon says this, your life is filled with busyness. There's a second thing that he says, though, that I wrote down. The second thing that I wrote down is this, your life is filled with burdens. Your life is filled with burdens. We see that in in the New Living Translation that we read just a few moments ago. Solomon says, I have seen the burden that God has placed on us all. As a pastor, I am amazed at the burdens carried by our church family. There is hardly a family that is not experiencing a challenge There's hardly a family that's not experiencing a trial, a tribulation, a heartache. I'm reminded of that old hymn that says it this way, days are filled with sorrow and care. Hearts are lonely and drear. If the hymn ended right there, man, it'd be discouraging, but the hymn goes on and says, burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. And so even though you and I have a life that is filled with burdens and sorrows and problems and trials, realize that Jesus has come to lift that burden off of us. Jesus has come to lighten our load. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 11 and verse 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens and I will give you rest. Are you burdened today? Do you have a burden on your heart that seems heavier than you can carry and you seem burdened down with that load and at times thinking, Brian, I just can't go on. Here comes Jesus on the white horse to the rescue. And Jesus says, let me take your burden. Solomon gets it. He says, your life is filled with busyness. Your life is filled with burdens. But there's a third thing that I mentioned in the passage. Your life and mine is filled with blessings. Our life is filled with blessings. We are so prone to remember the burdens, but to forget the blessings. We recall the trials, but we overlook the triumphs. And Solomon says, man, I get it. Your life is busy, busier than you want it to be. And you're burdened down with with all kinds of trials and tribulations and burdens. He says, but in the midst of all of that, you are extremely blessed. And this morning I would tell you that I do not know what you are going through today. You might be experiencing a weight, a trial that none of us can even begin to comprehend. But I would tell you two things today. Number one, Jesus understands. And Jesus is right with you. And the second thing, in your life, if you will look for them, you are extremely blessed. Because with the burdens comes blessing. Solomon mentions that. Notice verses 12 and verse 13. So I concluded that there is nothing better than to be happy and to enjoy ourselves as long as we can and that people should eat and drink. Hey, here's what he says. I love this. Enjoy eating. He gives you here a green light to eat. Isn't that fantastic? He says, enjoy eating. Enjoy drinking. Enjoy the fruits of your labor. He makes this great statement. He says, for those are gifts from God. Solomon says, be happy. Enjoy life. Count your blessings. Remember that old hymn? Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. Then it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Hey, hey, would you do me a favor? 
just on the side of your outline, would you take just a second and write down two or three blessings that God has given to you? Would you do that? Let's pause for just a second. Reflect, write down two or three blessings that God has given to you. And then when you go home, take just a few moments and thank God for those blessings. You might not have much today, but you have more than the majority of the people around the world. You might not have a physical, biological family, but you have a church family that loves you. You might not have tremendous health, but you're alive this morning. You're alive so much that you can stand up and walk into this building today. God has blessed you and God has blessed me. Count your blessings. Jeremiah says life is filled with, or excuse me, Solomon says life is filled with busyness, is filled with burdens, and is filled with blessings. But he mentions a fourth thing. The fourth thing he says, he says your life is filled with beauty. Your life is filled with beauty. We looked at this verse briefly last week. Verse 11 says, Yet God has made everything beautiful in His time. We saw that last week. To God, the pain is just as beautiful as the pleasure. To God, death is just as joyous as birth. To God, grieving is just as important as dancing. And by the way, I mentioned last week, Allison and Lucas, who we thought, sat over here, thought we're gonna have a baby. They haven't had their baby. They're on this side today, just a little bit closer to the door in case the baby comes. And so we're hoping that birth happens this week. But in God's eyes, as beautiful as birth is, and it is, death is just as beautiful. And in God's eyes, just as beautiful as pleasure and laughter and joy and satisfaction, so is pain and trials and tribulations. Everything is beautiful in God's time. Here's what Solomon says, life is brief, enjoy it. Although life is filled with many events, life is brief. James says it this way in James chapter 4 and verse 14. How do you know that your life, or how do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here for a little while, and then it's gone. Listen, your life is brief. Make it count today. Don't procrastinate. You have no promise that you're going to be alive tomorrow. I don't either. Make your life count today. What God wants you to do, do it today. What God wants you to change, change it today. Today, become the man and the woman that God wants you to be. Life is brief. Make it count. There's a second truth that we see in the passage The second truth is this, eternity is real. Prepare for it. As I mentioned in the beginning of the message, there there is much debate as to what this verse means. When he says once again, he has planted eternity in the human heart. Just exactly what does that mean? What is the meaning of eternity? Let me give you two thoughts There's kind of 10, but I'm going to give you two today. Two thoughts, two main thoughts or ways that that this phrase can be practically applied to us. The first is this. You were created with a God consciousness. You were large G, not small G, all right? The the idea does not mean that you are God and that you have this God consciousness within you as if you yourself were divine. That's not what we mean today. You were created with a God consciousness, large G. You, You were created with a consciousness within you that there is a supreme being that exists. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27 says this, So God created human beings in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. Here's the idea that I want you to catch this morning. You were created with the ability to relate, to interact, and to communicate with God. 
Think about that for just a second. You were created with the ability to relate, to interact, and to communicate with God. As human beings, we are the only one in all of God's creation here on earth that was given that ability. You were created in God's image. What does that mean? Let me give you two reasons. I didn't put them in your notes. How should we respond to that? The first is reflection. You and I should reflect God's glory. We were created like Him. So just as the moon reflects the light of the sun, so you and I should reflect the light of Jesus Christ as those that were created in His image. But the second is this, not just reflection, but relationship. You were created for the purpose of having a relationship with God. One author said it this way, there's a God-sized hole in every human heart that only God can fill. That's why so many people like Solomon are trying to fill that hole with other things. They're trying to fill it with pleasure. They're trying to fill it with wealth. They're trying to fill it with popularity. They're trying to fill it with success. A variety of things. And there is nothing else other than God that fulfill or that fills that hole. You were created with a God consciousness. The second thing that I would mention is this though. You were created with an an eternal perspective. You and I were created with an eternal perspective. It's amazing when you study anthropology, as I'm sure some of you have, when you study anthropology, it's amazing that almost all religions and people groups of the world have some sort of a belief of the afterlife. Even people that have never had a copy of the Bible, that have never had a copy of the Word of God, tribes in the remotest parts of the world, they have some sort of a belief system in the afterlife that something is going to happen, something's going to transpire after this life. Some psychologists and neurologists believe that we are hardwired, that God has hardwired us to believe in an afterlife. I believe that's exactly what this verse is saying. Solomon is saying that man was created, that there is a reality, that there's a realization that there is more to life than this. There's more to our existence than this. That reality scares some people, and that reality encourages others. Dennis Miller, the comedian, said this about eternity. He says, it's ironic that in our culture, everyone's biggest complaint is about not having enough time. Yet nothing terrifies us more than the thought of eternity. When all of a sudden we have all the time we need, if we're not careful, if we don't know what eternity holds, that thought terrifies us. So eternity should motivate us. We've seen in the passage what it means How does eternity motivate us? Two ways. Let me mention these ways in your notes. The first is this. The foolish prepare for this life and not for the life to come. The foolish prepare for this life and not for the life to come. Jesus said it this way. I'd rather use the words of Jesus. Jesus says, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world and yet you lose your own soul. Let me translate what Jesus is saying. He said, what do you benefit if you're a winner in this life, but you're a loser in the next? What do you benefit if everything in this life is in order, but in the next life, it's completely out of order? I placed a quote in your outline at the bottom of the page by a man named John Tillotson. He was, he was the Archbishop of Canterbury several hundred years ago, and he made this phrase or this statement. He says, he who provides for this life but does not take care for eternity is wise for a moment, but a fool forever. The psalmist said it this way, the fool had said in his heart, there is no God. 
And it's the foolish person that lives for this life, but doesn't live for the life to come. Let, let me pause this morning and say this. If you're not ready for eternity, and you might sit back and say, okay, Brian, exactly what does that mean? I mean, it's so ambiguous. It's so uh, ephemeral. What do you mean by that? Well, if we believe that God is eternal, if we believe that God never had a beginning and God never had an end, and we believe that God created us to be eternal creatures, yet because of our sin, death entered into our existence. If we believe that, and if we believe, as the Bible teaches, that God and His love and His compassion sent Jesus Christ as the answer to the fact that we blew it, then the simple truth is that the meaning for this life and the meaning for the life to come is only found in Jesus Christ. And so the question this morning is this, do you know that your sins are forgiven? Have you by faith embraced and accepted what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you? Do you know, John says in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13, that we might know that we have eternal life. I trust that you know that today. If you don't, man, we'd love to have a conversation with you at the conclusion of the service and show you what the Bible says. The foolish prepare for this life and not for the life to come. The faithful, though, the faithful realize that the best is yet to come. The faithful realize that, yes, there is something after this life. And not only is there something after this life, but there is something better after this life. It only gets better from here. I love the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Paul says, For we know that when this earthly tent we live in, speaking of our bodies, is taken down, that is when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies and we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. For we will put on heavenly bodies. We will not be spirits without bodies. While we live in these earthly bodies, we groan and sigh. But it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies. So that these old bodies, dying bodies, will be swallowed up in life. You see, we realize that there's a better day coming. We realize today that there's a day coming in which cancer will not exist. We realize that there's a day coming that we will never have to say goodbye to a loved one again. We realize that there's a day coming that we're never going to have to put up with an obnoxious boss or obnoxious co-workers. We realize that there's a day coming when everyone around us will be perfect just as we are perfect. There's a day coming that we'll wake up and we will see the face of Jesus. There is a better day that is coming. And for those of us who know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, it motivates us. We live not for this life. We live for the life to come. Eternity is real. Prepare for it. Solomon mentions two other things. Let me mention them briefly. The second, or the third thing he says is this. Life is complex. You cannot understand it. Notice the latter part of verse 11. Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. The NIV says it this way. No one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. The New Century Version says, but people can never completely understand what He is doing. Two thoughts. Let me give them to you quickly. The first is this. The work of God is beyond our comprehension. 
The work of God is beyond our comprehension. When we look at what God's hands have formed, what God has created, we are nothing short of amazed. Who can understand the complexities of the universe? Who can understand the human body? The work of God is beyond our comprehension. Isaiah said it this way, have you never heard, have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can make measure the depths of his understanding we cannot comprehend God but the second thing that I would mention is this it becomes personal the will of God is beyond our comprehension you see we not only cannot understand what God does we cannot comprehend why he does it his will is often beyond our grasp why does one person survive cancer and another doesn't. Why does God allow that fatal automobile accident? Why, why did my business go bankrupt, God? Why are my kids healthy, Lord, and some other family's kids are not? Why was I born in the United States of America and someone else was born in a war-torn country? You're not the first to ask those questions. Job said it this way, can you solve the mysteries of God? Can you discover everything about the Almighty? Such knowledge is higher than the heavens. And who are you? It is deeper than the underworld. What you do, or than the underworld, what you do know, it is broader than the earth and wider than the sea. And God said through Isaiah, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts. My ways are far beyond anything that you could ever understand. The work of God is incomprehensible. And the will of God is incomprehensible. How do we respond then when God allows something in our life that we just do not understand? The rest of our passage tells us. Verse 14 says this. And I know that whatever God does is final. Nothing can be added to it or nothing can be taken away from it. Verse 15, what is happening now has happened before and will happen again. In other words, as Solomon said, there is nothing new under the sun. What is it? How is it that we should respond let me give you three thoughts and we'll conclude today. The first is this. Everything that God does is complete. Everything that God does is perfect. He never does anything halfway. He never stops in the middle of anything. My wife can, uh, accuses me all the time, and rightfully so, that I stop in the middle of a lot of things. She'll walk in the kitchen, and all the cabinets will be open, and the drawers will be open. And she'll walk in, and she'll say, were you in the kitchen, Brian? Obviously, the answer is yes. Why? Because I took something out, but I didn't close the doors. I didn't finish the job. God never doesn't finish the job. He always finishes what he starts. Everything that God does is complete. That includes your life and mine. Paul said it this way in Philippians 1.6, and I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue until it is finally finished when Jesus Christ returns. Everything God does is complete. The second thing is we've already seen in this book, everything God does is for your good. God doesn't do anything that is not for our good. We might not understand it. We might not comprehend it. We might not like it. But everything that God does is for our good. He never makes a mistake. Romans 8.28 applied for Paul, and Romans 8.28 applies for you and me today. God uses all things for our good. So how do we respond to that? Just as Solomon says, everything that God does is worthy of our trust and our worship. Notice verse 14, how he says this. And I know that whatever God does is final. Nothing can be added to it or taken from it. God's purpose is that people should fear him. 
Let me, let me take just a second and explain that. That's really important because so many people in this day and age thinks that, you know, God's up in heaven and he takes pleasure in us being terrified of him. And God does things just to remind us that he's the all-powerful one and we're the weak ones so that we're scared of him. That's not what this word means. The Old Testament word for fear means reverential trust. Reverential trust and in awe of God. So, so when Solomon says, man, here's the conclusion of the whole matter. Here's why God does this. So that you would fear Him. God doesn't want you to be terrified of Him. God wants you to trust Him. And God wants you to worship Him. And so as Jen and Jackie illustrated, whenever that big bonus check comes into our lives, how do we respond? God, I thank you. I worship you. I trust you. And when we have that huge need, that bill, the car that breaks down that we cannot afford to fix, we respond in the exact same way. God, I, I trust you. I trust you in the good times. I trust you in the bad times. I trust you in plenty, and I trust you when I have very little. I trust you, and I worship you. I worship you, Almighty God, no matter what happens in my life. Why? Because I realize, I realize that my life is just this. What I'm living right now is just this this. And you and I are going to live forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. We were made for eternity. So the question today is this, are you living for today or are you living for eternity? Are you ready, not just for tomorrow, but are you ready for eternity? Everything that God desires for you and I to experience.